my name is Mary Jutton. I'm a founder of a company called Tracklight, but tonight I have my co-conspirator of Evolve Law hat on. And, ooh, that's kind of scary. Um, so I wanted to first thank WeWork and LA Tech Watch for promoting this, along with our normal thank you to Davis Wright Tremaine, who's a founding member of Evolve Law. And we have Avo, another founding member, and LegalZoom, who is joining, and we're excited about that. And then we always like to thank Cleo, and thank you to our panel for coming, and Jules is going to take care of that intro. So just a really quick um, overview, Evolve Law is about accelerating the pace of the adoption of legal technology, so we're super excited to hear about what the legal tech companies can do to um, gather the investment they need and hear from some of these people tonight. So I'm going to turn it over to Jules, and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, are you guys comfortable? You're cool? Okay. All right. <laughs> it's not awkward at all. Um, cool. I'll be awkward over here. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm Jules. I'm a co-founder of Evolve Law with Mary. And we're talking today about investment in legal tech, which is something we care deeply about because we think this is one way to really accelerate the adoption of uh, legal technology, and it's to get VCs to invest in legal tech a little bit more. So we're going to hear from our illustrious panel of experts here on their experience raising money, looking at legal tech, and uh, and talking about how, as entrepreneurs, we can position ourselves well to invest, uh, to be, become a portfolio company of, legal, of a VC. So I'm going to do quick introductions, and then we'll go straight to the questions. So uh, my I'm Jules, co-founder of uh, Evolve Law and also of Hire and Esquire. We raised about $2 million in funding and uh, happy to be here. So we have Karen Nortman from Upfront Ventures. So she joined Upfront Ventures in November 2014. She's currently chairman of Seedling, which recently merged, merged with Moonfry, and she was co-founder and CEO there. Uh, prior to Moonfry, she spent seven years at IAC, where she was the senior VP and general manager of Urban Spoon and City Search, so pretty badass, thank you. Um, and uh, she also serves as a board member to Hatch and Hatch Labs, which is IAC's mobile incubator, and she recruited and advised Tinder. So, Many people in this room probably thank you for that as well. Uh, so we asked everyone as a little icebreaker here to do their favorite lawyer of all time, whether that's past, present, or fictional. So we have some good ones here. Uh, Kara's was actually the two attorneys who worked with her pro bono first for, for one of your companies at Cooley, and their names are Robin Sires and Mike Lincoln, and they helped her really get her company started for, for, for free. <laughs> I paid a lot later. <laughs> <laughs> you always do. You always do. Um, so cool. And then uh, we have Chavs Rempenthal from uh, from LegalZoom. So he's the general counsel there since, and has been there since October 2003. So you've been there a while. Right on. Um, he, and he's also corporate secretary since February 2007. Before LegalZoom, he was a partner at Bellinger and Rempenthal. And from October... 2002 to 2003, and then he, before that, he's been a lawyer at a couple of other places in Boston and Los Angeles, and he also served as an officer and aviator in the U.S. Navy. And his favorite lawyer is Ron. Oh, right on, good timing. Um, and his favorite lawyer is Ron Laflamme from Silicon Valley. So, yeah, so Ron Laflamme. <laughs> and then, by the way, when I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about my favorite lawyer of all time. I mean, there's so many awesome, like, Lincoln and, like, Thurgood Marshall. It's like, I didn't want to diss anyone, so I really went with the uh, the embodiment of technology law, which is Ron Laflamme, who is just my just my favorite. Uh, he is nonchalant, uh, you know, feet up on the desk while he's the tech is the best. A parody, but funny because it's true. Yes. <laughs> All right, and finally we have Josh King, uh, who is general counsel and VP of business development, AVO. He's responsible for legal, business development, business operations, customer service, and human resources. He is a frequent writer and speaker, and before AVO, he spent a decade in the wireless industry uh, in a mix of legal and non-legal roles. And uh, he started his career as a litigator in San Francisco, and his favorite lawyer is yet another iconic fictional lawyer in Saul Goodman. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so with that, we'll just jump into it. So I want to hear from the panel, what is your background in legal tech? So for Kara, what have you looked at? What investments have you looked at in the space? Have you made any investments? And for the other two guys, what is your experience um, getting funding in the legal tech space and from who? 
so uh, my both both of my siblings were lawyers, and my father is often a medical legal expert. So I'm surrounded by law. Though both of my siblings are now ex lawyers, so um, and both made the transition into much more uh, kind of business and entrepreneurial environments. And I before I was at IAC, um, I was at a place called Battery Ventures, a venture firm. Uh, between the West Coast and Boston. And I actually started looking at, I guess, what we'd call legal tech back then, probably 2004, 2005. Looked very closely at a company called Axiom Legal. And I was curious to see what had happened with Axiom. And I looked them up uh, last night, actually. And uh, I mean, it seems like they're doing pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, largest law firm in the world, so I would probably should have invested. Actually, I remember that. I mean, I was in a senior associate at the time, and I remember that as a deal I lost, which um, didn't happen that often back then, and I particularly, so I always thought back uh, uh, to Axiom, but anyway, that was the beginning of when I started looking at um, legal tech, and really, um, and then I've looked at a bunch of things recently, I've spent time with folks like Paul in the back, but I, I, there's a couple of different themes that I find very interesting across different industries that, you know, attack big portions of our GDP, and um, the legal field has just always been fundamentally an interesting one to me because you have sort of a lot of trends that have yet to hit the legal world in ways that seem like they would be productive. The consumerization of tech, you know, kind of enterprise tools, democratizing access. Um, and then what I've increasingly found is that I'm just really interested in heavily regulated industries where a lot of the companies I'm co-founding, you wouldn't call legal tech, but they have a lawyer as a co-founder and I view that as a big strategic advantage. So I haven't invested in a pure legal tech company, but I've only been back in VC um, for about a year, and we make one or two investments a year, um, but I actively spend time looking into it. All right, so uh, my, my background is, is, is interesting. I, I guess if I were, uh, if you think back to the old commercials, the Gillette, like I love the company so much I bought it. Um, I, I view LegalZoom as, as really, when you think about consumer and legal tech, um, and we'll get into a little bit more about you know my views on whether LegalZoom is purely a tech company or, or not. But it actually predated that. When I was at Testa Horowitz and Tebow uh, out in Boston, we had a very interesting way of getting work to uh, associates. You could never actually go to a partner, and partners could never come to you and give you work. It was all done through a system called the Flash Report that a lawyer who was just kind of enterprising in his third year just kind of quit and developed this software to route new matters, uh, corporate technology matters, to individual lawyers to ensure that they had a wide variety of different matters that they were working on and to take into account how busy they were. So every Friday, you would submit how busy you were, you would submit what things you'd worked on the past week, and it would find all the new deals that you would get for the next week. And it was my first real understanding, other than using Westlaw or Lexis, which I don't view as legal tech at all, but just a search tool, um, a customized search tool for legal, and it really got me starting to think that, wow, you know, we just made the distribution of work more fair, and we made better lawyers by doing it that way. And when I found out that LegalZoom was looking for a general counsel, I happened to know someone who was affiliated with them. We'd gone to law school together. Uh, this guy, Gary Cullis, he's like, you got to fly out to LA right now and meet these guys. Th these guys are great. They know exactly what they're doing. And he's like, I think you have the right understanding of what it is that they're trying to do to, to really kind of fill that gap. And so then, obviously, over the last 12 years, my role in legal tech has, has very much changed. Um, we actually use a decent amount. Um, I wouldn't call it, I don't think we're at the top in our own legal department to try and make things efficient, make it operate uh, operational efficiencies. Um, but the bigger thing is really taking a look, and Vanessa, who's out in the audience, who uh, works and runs our product development from the legal side, is trying to make really great architected legal solutions that can be, that can be kind of distributed to the masses through the, through the software that we have. And to me, that it, watching how that's really changed the way that individuals view law, uh, the consumers, that, like, they, they start understanding why law is necessary. And I think as a legal profession, it's something that we have not done a good job of. We don't tell people why we're awesome, why we're necessary, why we're needed. Instead, they're just jokes. And so it's really, I, I think that uh, maybe for the next 10 years, if I'm lucky enough to stay here, I'm gonna try and turn around that, that philosophy. Lawyers aren't jokes, they're people that you're gonna want, people that you're gonna need, people that are gonna help you. And I think the only way we get there is through, tech, uh, through the, the judicious and efficient use of technology. Howdy. So I, I've been at Avo uh, just over eight years now, and I, I joined out of the wireless industry, so it was a sort of a, I've been in technology for a long time, but it was a very different kind of technology. And in fact, I hadn't even been practicing law for the five years before I came to Avo. I was doing mergers and acquisitions work in wireless. Um, but I really kind of wanted to do something a little bit different. And um, 
Avo, as it turned out at that time, had, had just launched. It was a couple months old and um, had been sued right out of the gate. And so to your point about heavily regulated industries and particularly trying to do something that might upset some lawyers, um, it's one of those unusual cases where, yeah, you do need a lawyer involved. Even though the company was founded by a lawyer, you needed someone who could be a full-time lawyer, um, even though I wore a lot of other hats, uh, right out of the gate. And so I, I have very quickly adopted over that time, maybe not quite the, the passion for legal tech that these guys have, but the, the passion for uh, free speech and consumer rights. Because one of the things I found almost immediately as I got into this is that you have huge swaths of the legal profession who really want to preserve their monopoly and shut consumers out from getting information. I mean, I routinely have people basically threaten to sue me for distributing true information about them because they want to hide it from consumers. And it's just, um, it's, in a way, it's kind of radicalized me to a certain extent. I mean, I've gone from this guy who was you know, buying and selling wireless spectrum, which is about as sort of commercial a thing as you can get, to someone who's doing a lot of writing and speaking about um, a whole bunch of free speech issues. And it's, it's something that I just continue to get uh, more deeply involved with. So um, that's really where I'm coming at it. Is, uh, and, and, and like Chaz said, I mean, there, are, there is a lot to be done here with consumers. And um, I think that's, that's somewhere where you know, both of our companies are on the forefront of and, and certainly is the, the area of legal tech that I'm most interested in. But you still dress like a lawyer. Only for something like this. I live in Seattle. I mean, how can I address that? Yeah. Awesome. So you've mentioned a couple. So there are always pros and cons of investing in every industry. What do you think are, are the pros and cons of investing in legal tech? We heard being more litigious in general, but what are what are other pros and cons? I mean, you know, I've spent a fair amount of time recently looking at new platforms, you know, new tools, technologies, platforms, et cetera, on the enterprise side, right? When you look at, you know, the amount of dollars spent by the big law firms and by the big corporations um, and the amount of inefficiencies and then the just general uh, levels of unhappiness. Um, it's one of the things that's always been interesting to me about this industry is just sort of the general levels of unhappiness by most people um, where um, where it seems like there are ways to solve this. But anyhow, if you, when I've dug into a lot of these companies recently, um, the decision making is very fragmented and I think there's just a general level of conservatism in taking risk, right? So nobody you know, nobody is fired, you know, no, there's not a huge amount of upside for whoever it is is making the decision around the, their discovery platform, right, or creating Slack-like tools for collaboration or things of that nature. So where we've seen the most innovation maybe in places like, and I don't know, because I, again, I, you know, I'm coming here humbly. As a VC, we have a lot of opinions and we're not afraid to share them, but, um, but I don't spend every waking minute looking at legal tech. I look at a lot of different industries, so feel free to disagree with me if I say something controversial. Um, but but, um, uh, but anyway, I mean, as, as, I, as I've dug into companies, you see companies like Lex Machina, which is like the grandfather of legal tech, uh, maybe along with, um, I mean, the kind of the new wave of legal tech. And it seems like they're doing quite well, but there's a real vested interest. Like, I'm going to have a greater chance to win, and I get that. But a lot of the other stuff, the decision making's fragmented. There's a general risk aversion. You know, you go into, I've, go, I've gone in diligence. To, platforms that look awesome, right? Great consumer interface, fast search, can pull it up on the iPad, things that when you talk to lawyers, like litigators, and especially, you know, young associates, it's like the, these dark, painful years of their lives um, uh, that that would be so well received, and yet I, you know, you, I get pointed in like four directions. Well, the par that paralegal makes that decision, the co-counsel makes that decision, and then I'm just the partner, but I don't really know what goes on. Um, and so, anyway, so I'd say that's a big one, like um, you know, kind of ri generally a little bit risk adverse, generally fragmented decision making, and generally maybe a sort of like a Disassociation between like ma like the, the reward associated with making these decisions, unless there is a direct economic impact that the decision maker understands. So part two of that question is insurmountable problems or no? Everything's surmountable. 
right? Like, I'm a total optimist. I'm an optimist that has to talk myself out of every investment. Uh, yeah, yeah, totally, totally surmountable. I mean, I, yeah, totally surmountable. I mean, the other thing I would say is sort of on the democratizing legal side, and you guys all have a great perspective on this, but um, there, there has, there, are, there do seem to be a lot of rules and regulations that can trip one up. And I was reading about your North Carolina case, and um, and you know, there, there seems like some of them, many of them, are there for reason, right? Ambulance chasers and taking, you know, kind of money away. From from unsuspecting grandmothers, et cetera. So kind of properly navigating, it's almost like it's the same issue in healthcare. How do you know your doctor's doing a good job or not? I don't know, their bedside manner may have absolutely no correlation to their ability to deliver good care. And oh, by the way, the doctors that have the lowest outcome rates, they may just be the best doctors that are getting the worst cases. And I think it's the same thing to some extent with the law. Like how do you judge, you know, kind of success and how do you rate and review lawyers and create a safe environment where you also democratize? Um, you know, I think that's a challenge where you have a few bad apples that can ruin it for a lot of people who want to create access. I think that's a trickier challenge to navigate but I know you guys are trying to navigate and certainly you guys are, so I'd, I'd be interested in hearing what you have to say about that. So what was the question? No. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I, I view legal tech in two, two kind of broad buckets. Uh, there's legal tech that uh, lawyers buy and there's technology that makes law more efficient for everyone. Um, you know, you think of e-discovery or case management systems or docketing systems, all the things that lawyers buy to make their own practice better, but don't really change the way they practice, right? They make them more efficient, they make them spend less time on certain tasks, they may even increase quality, right? A docketing system can keep you from forgetting a deadline, but it doesn't actually do anything to make the legal work necessarily better for the consumer. And oftentimes when I talk to lawyers about their view of legal tech, which is stuff that makes me more efficient, they think of it in the, well, it makes me more efficient so I can charge the same amount for doing less work, right? That's what true legal tech is. Give, you know, the e-discovery and let some computer program do it, but then I still have to manage it, and therefore I'll still charge the same amount as if I'd gone through 1,600 boxes of documents. Then there's the second part, which is a part that I think uh, you know, the Josh's company, LegalZoom, and a, and a host of others are looking at, which is, what about the pie that's not getting eaten? There, there, there are so much underconsumption of law right now. Um, it, it, when, I, when I talk in, in bar associations and groups of le less than happy people to come see me, uh, I often say, people aren't buying what you're selling. Doesn't that bother you? Like, doesn't it bother you that all of you are chasing the same three or four or five percent of consumers and businesses? and that you aren't able to adapt your own business using technology, using branding, using automation, using so many of the tools that other businesses are using right now, today, to start serving the 80, 85, 90, some people say 92% of the population that has no viable access to legal services. Now, if I sound like I'm on a soapbox, I am. Uh, but the fact is, it's true. And, and we really need to start thinking about those as solutions and that, to me, is the real, is the, the kind of real legal tech. Um, we, we were talking about uh, ratings, and, I, and I'm sure Josh is going to talk a lot about this. But I, I recently did, did a little work on my home, and I didn't do it all myself. I, I tried, uh, but I, I went to Angie's List, and I found a contractor. Now, some people use uh, Service Advisor, others they're they're all good. Home Advisor, home advisor yeah, they're all good. Uh, the wacky part was I actually did a search, and I, I did a search. Does Angie's List rate lawyers? Does anyone know? No, they do not. Do you know that it was a 400 person viewed question to Angie's List with like hundreds of people responding? The number one answer was, wow, that's too bad because if I think about law, it's really important. The, the, the person understanding what my problem is and knowing how to solve it, I'd like to know that. And knowing that they had good outcomes with other people, I'd like to know that too. So why not? The number two best answer, probably afraid of getting sued. <laughs> dot, 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 <laughs> and that's it. In, in, a, in an industry where hiding the ball on quality and performance and service and customer care is more important than actually serving the customer, that's a system that needs to be upended. It's ripe. I hate to use the word disruption because we're not disrupting an industry. That industry does not exist. The industry that serves the middle class and the small business isn't there. There's no one to disrupt. We're going to actually create an industry. And I think that's really where, uh, what I think of legal tech, that's the stuff that really gets me jazzed up. 
Yeah, I mean, let me expand on that for just a moment. So when it comes to uh, absolutely the point about heavily regulated, the point about conservative, and, and we've faced that in spades, I mean, getting sued right out of the gate, which was great PR, by the way. But awesome. um, I thought it was on purpose. But it was, <laughs> it was certainly stressful. And, and over the last eight years, we've been sued a few other times. I've actually, I, I, I keep a file, it's gotten voluminous now, of all of the legal threats and cease and desist letters I receive. I mean, it, it averages, uh, uh, over the last eight years, it's, it, it's probably dying down just a little bit, but it's, it's still probably four or five a month um, of just out and out writing, give me your agent for service of process, I'm going to sue you, which almost never happens, by the way. So there's a little bit of a lesson learned there. You don't necessarily need to take cease and desist letters seriously. Um, They're cathartic. Yeah, I, I find them highly amusing. I might publish a book out of it someday. Um, but it's, I, I've developed a very thick skin over the years uh, at working at AVA because I talked to a lot of um, very unhappy attorneys. But Chaz is right. I mean, when you think about legal tech, I mean, a lot of the problems you're trying to solve here, and, and this will probably relate to some of the questions about raising money, I mean, they, it really gets to the, the size of the opportunity. I mean, the, the, the TAM is, is all important, total addressable market. And if you, um, a lot of these technology problems need to be solved, and they might make for some great small businesses, but they're, you know, they're not going to change the world, and they're not because they just fundamentally, um, you know, they have a very small market that needs to be fixed there. The consumer legal market, on the other hand, I mean, the, the size of the overall legal market in the U.S. right now is estimated at $200 billion um, annually. But there's also, and I totally share Chaz's view on this, there's this um, undercurrent of people who just do not access the market. And they don't access it because, unlike every other industry, um, the law has really given people only two stark choices. And uh, I like to analogize it to the fashion industry, um, where in the fashion industry, I mean, you can buy everything from, um, you know, a $20 pair of pants at Old Navy to a $1,500 pair of jeans down at the mall, and everything in between. You've got high fashion, you've got low fashion, you've got mass market, you've got off the rack, it's, it's all in there. Whereas in law, we've given people the choice between um, completely bespoke custom and, you know, go get a pattern from Joanne's Fabrics and make it yourself. And you really don't have, you have very, very little in between. Um, now, Chaz's company is trying to do something about that, we're trying to do something about that. Uh, but that is where there is a massive opportunity if you can find ways, either as a legal tech company or by enabling lawyers to start making products and developing more of a process mindset so that they can serve those people who are just opting out of the system because they've got no choice but to get full scope representation where they're, you know, they don't know whether they're going to get a bill for four or $5,000 at the end of the month that they, they're ill positioned to pay. If I can really quickly add on that, one of the things that's my favorite part about the, the suit analogy, which I, I, I think is spot on, is that when the lawyer goes back in the back room, they snicker and grab something that's already mostly completed and then just stitch a few things on it and give it to you and pretend like it's bespoke, but it really is not. Almost nothing that we do in law is brand new. Almost nothing. Uh, it's been done before. Uh, it, it, the venture capital documents have been executed before. Convertible notes have been done before. You know, you don't have to create this. So when people say it's bespoke, it's really more of a myth. It's it's you get the idea of it, but it really doesn't happen. And so I think that's also kind of a you know they're they're selling us goods that don't exist sometimes. Yeah, and thank you for teeing up my next question, which is what other industries are most similar to legal tech? And I think that's a good analogy in general, but in terms of investment, legal tech tends to be 15 or so years behind every other industry. So at Evolve Law, we've talked about it being comparable to FinTech, to EdTech, but I guess, Kara, as the investor on the panel, what other industries are parallel to legal that we can see as, uh, as a trend that we're going to follow? Yeah, I mean, I, I, obviously, I think there, there, there are a lot of parallels to any industry that has a heavy amount of regulation. Um, but I do think there are some really important nuances. So um, if you look at fintech to start with, um, a place where, where my firm has done a fair amount of investing, there is always a financial reward to serving customers better, differently, uh, performing, creating. You know, if you can democratize access to loans, right, there's people just seem to, you know, they get that, they understand that. The user behavior is, 
is not there, but anytime you're trying to get people more money than they've previously had access to, it's much easier to get consumer adoption, you know, on one side. And um, anytime you can get, you know, organizations better data about the people they're trying to serve um, that will help them with default rates. Like, so there, there's just a much more direct connection to capitalism in a way with, um, I think, efficient models that allow, I mean, it's probably why we've seen so many successful fintech companies and you know, we haven't seen that. I mean, like LegalZoom is, you know, LegalZoom is probably the biggest, right, around. And um, you have companies like Axiom Law that's now doing 200 million. You guys have been around done well, but there aren't, you can't name 10, right? In FinTech, you could probably name 50. Um, then the other one that I think about a lot these days is healthcare. And um, there's some, you know, life or death type regulations there. But, you know, healthcare is really like, it's probably the most interesting time. I mean, so my father's a doctor, my grandfather was a doctor, and so I'm surrounded by healthcare policy. But it's the most interesting time in my life um, to think about and talk about healthcare. And it's very heavily driven by regulatory changes, right? So um, in this case, I think like actually a lot of what's been done on the regulatory level, Obamacare, et cetera, and its impact around deductibles going up, moving to capitation models, Etc. It's created an environment where healthcare is just much more expensive the way it is to a lot of individuals and organizations, and you have a whole host of individuals who have access to it who never have before, and so it's creating a lot of room for innovation, right? Like direct to consumer models where people will just go outside of insurance because they have a $2,400 deductible and hopefully they never hit it in a year. Um, in organizations that have a thousand employees or more self-insuring and needing to come up with their own sort of actuarial data and, and ways to help reduce costs. So anyway, long story short, I think that there are, you know, those are two examples of industries that are a little bit different. One where I think the financial returns are more directly tied and one where we've had some like exogenous regulatory change that's fostering change overall, right? Like if we had significant, I'm making this stuff up, tell me if I sound like I know what I'm talking about, but if we had significant tort reform or something that caused big pockets of dollars not to exist anymore, you might have a lot more innovation because we have whatever excess capacity we have right now, we'd have a whole lot more, right? And so a lot of what gets me excited um, are things like how do we reduce litigation? How do we take all this time and energy spent and suing each other and, and allow people to innovate without fear, right? Um, when I started my company, which is called Seedling, and any of you with kids should go buy toys and gifts from it. Um, I had to spend hours and tons of money with safety lawyers around consumer product laws, and I was like, there should be a better, easier way to do this when I'm just starting without fear of like losing the company in the first month. So, um, you know, anyway, so long story short, um, uh, I mean, one more anecdote, my co-founder's from New Zealand, and they have free medical care there. Um, and she's constantly telling me how terrible our medical system is. And um, she's like, you know what? We all get cared for. We have pretty good outcomes. And you're not allowed to sue. Like, what do you mean you're not allowed to sue? If something goes wrong, you just die. You know, like there's no. <laughs> and, and so, you know, I guess the question is, you know, things like that. Yeah, anyway, I just thought it was a funny anecdote, but um, a bit, bit, bit off to the side. But anyway, I think there are a lot of, to me, though, I don't, I'm, I don't mean to be negative. I'm actually very positive. These are the industries, the industries that are the most interesting to me because, by the way, they can't be built by a 21-year-old out of Stanford who is good at writing code. Like, you have to have a really nuanced understanding of these markets and regulations and partnerships and go-to-market strategies, and the dollars available are so much greater than they are um, versus the next, you know, photo sharing app. So I think it's super exciting. There's a lot of similarities, but um, I would love there to be an exogenous force that made behavioral change um, uh, faster in legal tech. How long till we have 50 legal tech companies you can make? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, what do you think? Yeah, I don't know. I do think there's probably some sort of external force that would catalyze it, um, but uh, I don't know. Consumer movement. I, I don't know. I don't know what it is. It'd, it'd be nice if there was something actually regulatory that that helped matters, um, but uh, but I don't. I, I think that's a it's a tough question to answer. Maybe there'll be an Elizabeth Warren for law. Maybe. All right. Yeah. So we're. You know, I don't know. I mean, there are things that I don't know if they've been tried or not that could just bring awareness, like, you know, pro bono platforms. You know, I mean, if there's all this, I, I don't know. Do those exist? Yes. Okay. They're not very good. 
you know, like I, I don't, I think a lot about the places the law touches industry where you can have a positive PR for law. So democracy, you know, pro bono work to try to remove litigation from the system, you know, giving, protecting like entrepreneurship in ways where people aren't getting into these other industries and, and starting things. So maybe legal tech needs a rebranding, right? Maybe we need to call everything that's going on in healthcare tech and fintech and education legal tech because legal governs the way these companies work and is often transportation. We invest in a company called Hop, Skip, Drive, which is um, basically a you know a ride sharing platform for your kids. It's really not a ride sharing platform. It's a platform that you know where you can have your kids safely delivered from one place to another. And it was co-founded by a lawyer, and uh, she's a ma major. I put her together with her other co-founder, who I went to business school with, and they're just a powerful team because they're just so on top of the regulation and safety and taking such an above board approach to it. Let's call that a legal tech company. I don't know if we call if we redefine it. I think we'll be there soon. Part of what we're trying to do at Evolve Law here, and I'll skip this question for you guys unless you have strong opinions and move to the next one. Cool. Okay, so we'll start with Josh and then go to Chaz. What is going to be bigger, consumer or enterprise legal tech? It's enterprise, right? Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> it, sh it, it should be consumer, of course, because it's um, that, that's where the hugest opportunity is right now. But I mean, one of the expanding on this point about regulation, this is where the problem lies, is that one of the reasons you don't have all these companies that you can name um, in this area like you might in virtually any other area is that unlike virtually any other area, you're dealing with an industry where business and business people can't invest directly in the products that face the consumers. And so that's what our businesses are trying to sort of engineer our ways around and find solutions for. And those of you who, who start le um, legal tech companies that want to try to solve this consumer problem, you're going to have to not only have your regulatory hats on, but you're going to have to be creative about coming up with ways to go out and, and get the people, the lawyers and the law firms who have to provide that service to the consumers and show them those solutions that they can use to, uh, to unlock that latent market. Um, but that, that said, I mean, that's, that's where the biggest, far and away the biggest opportunity lies. I mean, everything on the enterprise side, there's lots of great opportunity there, but it's really around optimization uh, where it's, it's, rev it's potential revolution on the consumer side. Yeah. I also think it could be both. Um, I think that a, an enterprise solution that's designed to aggregate lawyers to efficiently practice at the top of their license can be a consumer solution. So we can you can actually end up being a little bit both. I mean, it could look like something that you would either sell to small law firms or, or small bands of lawyers that will actually allow them to start practicing together, to specialize, to, to really start practicing the law that they wanted instead of figuring out how to collect, how to bill, how to, you know, whether or not they've got a good enough golf game to take someone out to land that business, all the stuff that really isn't the practice of law. Professor Hadfield at USC says that she, she has estimated that out of a $200 billable hour, probably 140 to 150 of it is just not the practice of law. It is collections, marketing, business development, uh, you know, sec you know, uh, work that is that that could have been done to a paralegal, but you couldn't afford a paralegal, so you did it yourself. I can say it. I've done it. When when I was a, a, in a, in a two-person practice, I actually had two billing rates: my billing rate for doing legal work and my billing rate for doing secretarial work, and I billed myself out appropriately. And I, I listed it out there. Hey, all I'm doing is typing something right now. I'm not going to hire someone else to do this, so I'll charge you, but it'll be less, right? So I think you can end up with, with something that's both. I do agree with Josh. I think that the problem is that it's, it's going to take a huge shift, not just a shift in regulation, but a shift in the mindset of the lawyer in the legal profession to start believing that a consumer solution will appropriately balance access and ethics, for lack of a better word, or professionalism. But new technology that just makes it more efficient to continue practicing law for the 1% isn't really going to do anything to increase the market. Um, it might make some clients happier, but it's not going to do anything to fundamentally move the needle for law. I agree. <laughs> Wow, that was short and sweet and surprising. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I agree. Uh, I do. I do still think uh, again, and I, I've only seen 
one or two companies in this area, but I, I do still think we all sue each other too much. And um, so the enterprise solutions probably make that easier, right, in some ways. And um, so things that we can do to create deterrence, that create awareness, that create shaming norms. I don't know what it is, right? Like one time I came home and told my sister, I said, why don't we create a public shaming platform, you know, for people who are suing for no reason? Because it just, it just governs, but it creates these behaviors like in our schools and everywhere else that it's like, you know, teach, I, I think I heard this TED talk on it once where it was like, a teacher afraid to, you know, you know, to do something creative in the classroom or to penal, you know, to teach a kid in a certain way because they're parents like went and sued the principal or you know something like that so anyway that, that would be the other thing like something that could get us to take all that time and money and energy and change in behavior which I think a lot of us are really tired of um, and catalyze like a, a change in that regard and I'll, I'll do a call out to Paul back there because he's starting a company that he started a company that I think is is trying to do that um, and become a deterrent and uh, reduce a lot of the time and effort associated with discovery in a way that I think could change behaviors Contract cloud. Hiring. They're hiring. <laughs> All right, awesome. So I guess back to Chaz. Will LegalZoom and the other platforms out there actually replace attorneys? And if so, or if not, um, if they're not going to replace them entirely, will there be contraction in the number of actual practicing lawyers as a result? Um, so, well, that's two questions. Will they replace and will it contract? Uh, Absolutely not and absolutely not. I mean, there's just no more succinct way to say that. So let me make it a little more verbose way. <laughs> right? So, so you're, but that's not true, Chaz. You, you started, your company starts doing, you know, incorporations for people so they can do it themselves. They're obviously not going to lawyers. Well, it's actually not true if those people weren't going to lawyers in the first place. So we weren't replacing lawyers anyway. And the fact of the matter is if a lawyer is charging you $1,500 or $2,500 to do something you can do for $150 with the exact same level of accuracy, that's something they shouldn't be doing anyway. That should not be the practice of law. I don't care whatever you say, it just shouldn't be. Now you think about the contraction. When you look at, and if you want to believe the ABA's numbers, and I'm gonna, I'll, I'll haircut them down to 85%. If you think of the fact that there are 85% of just Americans that are underserved, you think about the number of people who are over the age of 18, it's like three times the entire population of, uh, of, of the United Kingdom. It's like 180 million people. If we can't figure out a way to completely put thousands and thousands and thousands of lawyers to work, even giving five or 10 minutes of legal help to each one of those people with a legal problem, how, how is that not more full employment for lawyers? It, it, it is, it should be. There, there's no reason why a solution should replace the professionals that are there and trained to do exactly what they're doing. What we should replace is the inefficiency in the model. We should replace the, the, the theory of the bespoke suit and come up with a really nice warm coat from Target that costs $39. There, not everyone needs, you know, if you're looking to raise, you know, $100,000 of, of some seed funding, it shouldn't cost you $20,000 in legal bills. It's ridiculous. You don't need to have the same level of protection that someone's raising $100 million as. So we need to find solutions and understand and explain the risk to entrepreneurs and to the small business, to the, to the, to the, to the consumer, the middle class consumer, that yeah, you know what, you know what, when you buy, for instance, if you think about it, if you buy a, 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 a car that is less expensive, that has maybe not as high of a safety rating as the super expensive car, you might have not the exact same level of amenities in there, but you understand it and you can make a choice. And the fact is right now we're saying it's, it's, it's Bentleys or it's nothing. And so most of people are just walking, which is not really safe either. Um, so so it's, I, I think that the, that the, the idea that we are replacing, or either of us could replace lawyers. I think is, is that only holds true if all we do is just make the current lawyers more powerful. Because you're right, a lawyer that can do ten things can do a hundred things with technology. So, but but, but the idea is you got to expand it down. Do you, do you think uh, law is being commoditized? It's demonetized. Hey, elaborate a little for me. I mean, I, I see legal zoom yeah. and uh, lack of lawyer. Lawyers, uh, you know, I'm a sole practitioner. Well, I have a small firm. Yeah. You know, it, it commoditizes essentially. I mean, in terms of the process, anything in terms of the process, black lawyer and legal doing really, essentially it's it's uh, turning in, turning these transactions into um, just a series of steps, and then you know, spitting out something at the end that is the exact same. 
That's what I mean by quantization. Yeah. Do you believe that's happening? I, so first off, I don't. I, so uh, I'm, I, my undergrad is in econ. Uh, econ and math. So when you say commoditization, when the when the when the monetary cost of creating another one is zero or effectively zero, then the price falls to zero. That's pretty much what that means. Uh, we don't we don't do commoditization, right? Up. Well, no, I, I don't think I'm showing off. I think that's pretty. Yes, I am. Uh, no, uh, when you think about what we do, it's really more productization. It's 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 packaging a system of. Of, uh, of legal documents, of advice, of information, uh, software branching that can help you so that when you say, I don't have kids, it doesn't ask you to name your three kids, right? Um, so it makes, it makes the consumer's experience a little faster, but what I will say is that the future of LegalZoom without professionals, without lawyers who can also layer on advice to it and give people upfront the advice to know whether they need a corp or an LLC or a will or a living trust, um, and then to help them through it when they get to a point where there's a little sticky that the market is going to, the market of just the pure kind of do-it-yourself is not, is not going to expand great enough. And I, and I also think that the amount of products that we can have, the things that we can offer, services you might call them, uh, will only grow if we can start funneling more and more professionals into the mix, which is why I believe that you know, when you look at, you know, there, there are lawyers that are out there and, and you can take a look at some of the statistics, you know, on average we're looking at they're working six, seven hundred hours, billing six or seven hundred hours a year. That's it. There are two thousand hours that you can bill if, if you even take two weeks off for vacation. So what, what's happening to all that other time? It's just not being utilized. So let's find a way to get them to not do the business of law and get them to do the practice of law and give them tools like automation, like smart searching for commonly answered questions and then leave them to be the true arbiters of advice, which is this could go either way here's why I'm going to tell you this way, even though both answers could be correct. I think that's truly what lawyers should be on the earth to do. I just want to add one thing, because I, I, I totally agree. And as you're talking about it, it makes me think, though, that that a, a helpful enterprise tools may free up even more capacity to do the stuff that's not commoditized, right? So even though it's continuing to help them serve that 1% better, um, you know, it, I don't know where it starts, the top or the bottom, but, you, you know, I mean, hopefully you have it at both places. And if I personally just want to think about, I mean, I'm overserved. Um, but still, I'm not, actually. I mean, I was thinking about it yesterday. I had a question about performance warrants that I was thinking about for one of my companies. And I didn't call one of my lawyers because um, I didn't want to be billed, right? I called, you know, one of my one of our principals who works across so many of our deals. And I said, I'm thinking about this way. Just walk through it with me. If there was an appropriately priced product, I'd much prefer to call one of my lawyers. Now, I'm sure they're billing something else right at that moment in time, but it's probably like redrafting the same documents that they've drafted 18 times. And so, and that it all kind of is cyclical, right? And that's why they're miserable, right? It's sort of, and the, the best lawyers, so I get to work with all sorts of different lawyers on different deals all the time. And I so value the best lawyers I work with because it is the advice, it is the way they navigate a deal, right? It is having a business sensibility that goes along with the legal sensibility, right, that can help you say, oh, you know what, this is what market is, but I think you can give on it. It's not that important. For some reason, other people are really digging in on this, right? And it's all of those things that, you know, like the, mo the most value and the least value that's delivered to me in my career comes from lawyers. Yeah, I can <laughs> that was 20 years ago. I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let me let me make a, a slightly less uh, political answer to that one. I, I actually think that that the law can't get commoditized quickly enough. Um, but I think that's like Chaz said. I think that's good for lawyers. And the, the problem is is precisely this issue that everyone's doing nothing. It's nothing but bespoke work. And so you should see the the number of lawyers expand, and you should see the the kind of work they're doing expand. But you will absolutely see some practices that are going to have to shift or die. Because what they're doing is they're selling consumers a box of rocks right now. They're giving them what is effectively a commoditized product at a bespoke price. Um, and what they really should be doing is creating these processes, setting stuff up so that they can be serving a much wider audience. Because, yeah, a, a lot of people just need that $39 code from, from Target. Um, and they know what the trade-offs are that go into it. And I, I know it appalls a lot of attorneys to hear that because they're, every client they're used to seeing has their own unique problems. But there's a huge number of people out there across a massive number of legal issues who can, who can be served by a commoditized product. And once you get them in there, 
It's just like your, your classic upsell. There's some percentage of them are going to have more complex problems or new problems down the pike. And that's where you get to use the top of your law license, is you've got the commoditized products to serve the mass out here, and then you've got your, where you're really doing your legal work to, uh, to do all of the custom stuff on top of it. Um, that just can't be the only market. Um. And I'm just going to take the analogy of the bespoke suit one step further. At Higher Now Square, I think we're doing the rent the runway model, where you're actually renting the gown that you need for one event and then sending it back when you don't need it anymore. So, um, And I know you guys are doing a marketplace as well. Um, all right, so we're going to get to investing in legal tech and a couple questions about that, and then we'll take Q&A from the audience. So uh, just quickly, I want to hear about your journeys as fundraising in the legal tech space uh, for the two of you guys, and then I have a couple questions after that. Yeah. Is, it um, is it harder to raise funds in the legal tech space? Well, it, I think it is fundamentally because a lot of the problems that you're trying to solve are going after small markets. And anytime you're going after a small market, it's hard to raise VC funds. I mean, VCs, for the most part, want to go after really big, really big markets. And so with, with AVA, we were fortunate in that we are going after a big consumer market, and so we have been able to raise money without any real particular problems. I mean, we've raised 130 some million dollars across five rounds. Um, and it's, I, I will say that when you're going through that process, the thing you want to make sure you do is that you don't let it consume the company because it can last as long as you want to let it last. And it's not what you want to be doing. I mean, you want to be running your business. And so you want to compress it into as small a time frame as possible. Um, and it, you know, what, what I've found in going through the process is that it, it also, um, there, there's a lot of difference as you go through it. Different companies are going to need different things from their investors. It's not just the money that the investors bring to the table. It's everything else they've got. And if you're, you know, if you're new, you're starting off, you don't have a lot of business experience, you may want a different type of VC than if you're like, like we were, we're a little bit of uh, an older management team, had a lot of experience, didn't need a lot of hand-holding, but really needed some help on the product and the strategic side. And we've had investors, fortunately, who've, who've been able to help us out with that. And so that's, that's certainly something that you've got to pay attention to. Um, you've got to pay attention to the, the non-monetary terms. And we can, we can get down into the weeds with that on, uh, if anyone's interested in it. But I've, I've certainly seen it. Um, and then you have the, the length and the diligence process. I mean, I, I remember our, our C round of, of funding. I mean, that whole process from start to finish probably took about five weeks and had next to no diligence. This last round, we did an E round for 70 million plus this summer. Um, that was every bit as, in, of in, as intensive on the diligence side as um, selling a company is. I've, I've gone through that a couple times, and it was it was proctological, let me tell you. And so awesome. you have got you have got to be ready for that, and you've got to be ready to to deal with that and set everything else aside, but also to put enough discipline into the process and in, in how you negotiate with your funder uh, your funders to make sure that it, it goes as as quickly as humanly possible. Uh, so at LegalZoom, we've uh, it's it's been a little different. Other than in the very beginning, before I was there, when they were raised a little seed money from friends and family, we've really had no need to raise any outside funds for working capital, like zero. Um, uh, that being said, over the last 10 years, we have brought in a little over $300 million of institutional money, but it wasn't so we could advertise. It wasn't so we could you know, spend on a Super Bowl ads. It was really to, to allow other investors that had been in for a really long time to realize some of the profit, and they've been relatively happy, I'd like to think. Um, that being said, you know, when you're getting people interested uh, and right now, I think a lot of people know uh, Premier as uh, you know the large, you know, largest shareholder at our company. It was pretty public. This happened uh, last year, 2014. But I, I, I will say that when you're getting people from whether it's a, a private equity space or a venture capital space, and they're coming in and taking a look at the at, at your company, and you know, you, you, the diligence happens on the documents. It happens on the uh, you know, the, 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 the people, but it really happens on the team, right? It happens on the executive and the management team uh, just as much. And, you know, you have to look at someone in the eye and say, yeah, you know what, you're right. There, if at any given time some state just decided to take us right to the mat and we got an adverse ruling, we could lose 4% of our addressable market like that. And they say, wait, wait, what? <laughs> and it's not, it's not in our control, right? Um, but you have to get people really 
to understand that you're the right team to bet on. And to do that, you just got to become, I mean, I felt like I had to become an expert. Like, I felt I had to know more than the bar regulators knew, and not just the bar regulator in California, but all 50 of the bar regulators in D.C. That I had to understand where, like you said, from a free speech, whether it's publishing legal information or from the idea of self-help books, right, when you think about the forms and instructions or you think about the ability to type, type, type stuff into forms, these are the kind of underpinnings for not the practice of law. And all we did was kind of group them together using technology. And so to go to someone and say, this is why we are okay standing solid, because I'll tell you, I mean, we, we, we looked into this. I looked into getting some real clearance from law firms and others saying, can we do it? And most of them are like, you, 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 we can't tell you you can do it, but we can't tell you you can't do it, right? With, with a very few exceptions. So you're going into really uncharted area where, you know, uh, one errant, you know, law or uh, a, a mad lawyer can really, really throw you off. And so you need to get the investor to be very comfortable that you know what you're talking about and that the regulation is something they don't need to be worried about. They need to be worried about the product, they need to be worried about the pricing, the positioning of it, and the addressable market. The other thing is I would say that Uber has removed that concern from a lot of investors because it's just shown that chutzpah goes a long way. <laughs> and a billion dollars. <laughs> and a lot of so we're, we're out of time, so we'll leave it with one last question, which is uh, what are your tips to entrepreneurs in the legal tech space who are trying to raise money? One yeah. You know, knowing that this, you guys are all lawyers, but probably like the most entrepreneurial of lawyers, I say just go for it. It's all crazy. Starting a company is the craziest thing you can do in, in the world, and you'll probably fail. So just get comfortable with that, and then just dig into like the deepest parts of your resilient self, and figure out how to do it by hook or crook without needing the validation of an investor. And by the way, not all models should be, it should be funded by investors, and some models should be funded by investors who aren't venture capitalists. As soon as you take my money, I need you to be really big. Right, so you know we write we write typically three to five million dollar checks. You usually get some seed funding before you get to us, you know. Um, but you know it, there are all sorts of ways to go fund and start companies. If I were going to start another one, it'd probably be a sock company, and I'd go to Shark Tank. But that's a whole separate story. But you know, I can tell you, I was not looking to start a company when I started one. I used to call entrepreneurship a disease when I was at Stanford that everyone had, and it just hit me and it bit me and it bit me when I was pregnant with my third child. And and I left a big, cushy, beautiful job with maternity leave and went out and started this thing, left my salary, left it all when I was six months pregnant with my third child. And it was terrible and awful and painful and wonderful and uh, was the best experience I had in my life. So um, anyway, I would just encourage you to go do it if you can do it, right? You know, if you're not going to be on the street with a tin cup and you can afford to live in that way. But even if it doesn't work, I don't think you'll ever regret following your dreams. And um, and uh, yeah, that my, that, those are my final words. Unfortunately, I'm going to sneak out. I've got an event at my kid's school, so I'm going to run. But thank you guys for having me. And you can all probably find me places. And it's great to meet you guys. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be very quick. Uh, so if you're going to fail, fail up, right? Learn and do something better. Uh, just because you have an idea doesn't mean you have a business. Just because you have a business doesn't mean you have a strategy. And just because you have a strategy doesn't mean you know how to scale. Those are things that all VCs really look for. And the other thing on top of it is a great team. Uh, I've represented a lot of VCs in my past life. A VC will invest in a great team with a moderately good idea way more than a crappy team with a phenomenal idea every single time, hands down. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I'll just give you a couple tactical things. I mean, um, one is that, yeah, your, your ideas are kind of pointless. It's all about your team and your execution. And so as a tactical thing on that, I see people do this all the time who have their, their, their and I see it a lot in the legal tech space because I think it's lawyers. Uh, they, won't talk, they don't want to talk to you until they'll put an NDA in front of you. Okay. Don't ever do that. Don't ever do that with someone you're asking for money from. from. Uh, it, it, you will look like an amateur. They won't sign it. Everyone sees so much deal flow, they can't think about dealing with NDAs. And it, and it doesn't matter. It's, there's, ideas are a dime a dozen. It all comes down fundamentally to the execution. And, and on that front, I mean, this is something I really learned in spades when we were getting started with Avo. Um, 
you have to be ready to hustle. I mean, there's just nothing like the hustle at the beginning days of, of your company. When nobody knows you, you go, like, I went from being in a really big company where I'd call people and my calls always got returned to, like, no, you know, you're just, nobody knows you, nobody cares. It's very humbling, but you got to keep doing it because it's just a massive hand crank, and it's, it's tremendously rewarding uh, no matter what happens. All right, well, thank you. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, so these guys will be around after to answer questions in person. Um, and then we, we have one more thing, so we're going to bring Leisha up here at Evolve Law. So thank you to our panel. At the end of every Evolve Law event, we like to do a Darwin talk, which leaves you to networking with something maybe a little controversial, something a little radical, an idea to think about, and Leisha is going to tell you what that is. Yeah. Hi. This was so radical an hour ago, and now suddenly it's not that radical. But I'm proceeding anyway. Okay, so this Darwin talk was created. It's modeled after Charles Darwin, who was a radical guy for his time, did radical things. Uh, great quote, it's not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. And that's what we're doing here at Evolve Law. So my Darwin talk, my three-minute Darwin talk, is uh, who's got it wrong, the VCs or the startups, when it comes to legal tech. And I was going to pose that it was actually the startups not being imaginative enough, not being big enough. But we've just heard a great explanation this whole evening about why that is already true. Um, but I think that it's not necessarily the size of the market that you're going after or the, uh, the, the, the what your, your plan is and what your product is, but the imagination, and this probably goes to the team. So uh, looking back at some initial pitch decks from some big companies, uh, LinkedIn, uh, their pitch deck was find and contact the people you need through the people you trust. They weren't pitching it as a, you know, a social networking tool. They fundamentally, what they were doing is really big and important, no matter the size of the tool. Airbnb, a web platform where users can rent out their space. It wasn't homeowners or, you know, you can have someone sleep on your couch. That's what it started as. But in fact, what they were doing was much bigger than that. And Uber, also, we see them moving into, like, uh, moving product now, not just people. And so fundamentally, it's like a platform, a way to move something from point A to point B and they disrupted a lot of stuff along the way. So I would say still, uh, you may disagree, but it's actually the startups and the entrepreneurs in the legal tech space who are thinking small about what their tool does versus what their tool can do to the legal technology space. Thank you. <laughs>